Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, another edition of uh, Friday Grade School. Really excited to be here, here hanging out with you guys again and talking some more color stuff. Uh, this week, I have uh, another awesome co-host with me. Gadali is going to help me with uh, checking out y'all's questions and getting them uh, fed over so we can answer as many as possible. Uh, Gadali, uh, among other, uh, among a number of uh, interesting qualifications and uh, skills, uh, he has uh, just launched a site called dvresolve.com where you can check out uh, all kinds of resources for uh, resolve and color grading uh, tutorials and products, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, it's already gotten massive response and uh, it's a really, really well curated and assembled uh, set of resources. So definitely recommend that to you guys. And yeah, let's get right into it. I'm excited to cover a couple questions that we heard in the comments this week and, and hear what you guys have uh, to ask of me today. But uh, Gadali, why don't we start with uh, something that we've got uh, in our, our list and take it from there. Uh, let's see, I am not hearing you, Gadali. All right. Oh, there we go. Good. We've got um, Do Sam who says, Hi, Colin. I like the tone splitting concept. However, I've been also taught to recover pure blacks at some point of grading. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you. Uh, a bit of a delay. Yeah, no, th so there's a delay with the live feed there. I think I remember the rest of that question, so I'm going to dive in and start answering it. And uh, in the future, Gadali, uh, the, in future time when you receive uh, my message, uh, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear now, so we're all good. Um, so let's talk about that first question. Okay. Yeah, we're good. So let's talk about that first question about balancing blacks and kind of how that fits into um, a film. Okay. Oh, Sam says, I like the tone splitting concept, but I've been taught to recover pure blacks. Okay. Got me. Okay, so let's talk about how this split toning concept kind of fits into uh, that more traditional notion of balancing our blacks or balancing our highlights for that matter. It's something that uh, a lot of us are taught when we first start grading and that you hear a lot about. And it definitely has its place, but it, it kind of goes back to a larger philosophical uh, sort of dichotomy that I see a lot when we're talking about image mastering. And that's uh, this difference between two concepts you guys have heard me talk about before of color correction versus color grading. And concepts like balancing your blacks or uh, neutralizing your blacks, it's one of those areas where like the language itself actually becomes quite important because we are talking about correcting something as opposed to neutralizing something. So my first instant question about like, oh, about like, like balancing your blacks is like, well, why are your blacks not balanced? Because if we're shooting through uh, an accurate device that's been recently calibrated, a good camera, which uh, we have like, wide access to uh, in 2021 and we're going through a proper color management pipeline my default uh, expectation is that i should have to do no balancing whatsoever I, I i am putting the burden of proof on balancing and generally if i see something like you know a, like poison shadows or highlights that are too green or whatever the first thing i'm going to do is try to figure out like well what's going on let me check my housekeeping and make sure that i've got all my ducks in a row and uh, ensure that i'm not introducing that problem somewhere now there can still be instances, of course, where we still need to balance things out manually. Maybe the sensor wasn't calibrated properly. Maybe the light source that was being used to illuminate the scene wasn't perfectly hitting uh, the color temperature that it's supposed to. There's still all kinds of variables, of course. But I just kind of want to start by saying that in a good color managed workflow with well captured negative, we should be suspicious anytime we need to balance. There should be, a, a, in general, we should be very, very balanced right out of the gate by the time we set up our color management pipeline. So let's talk about, uh, you know, like when we do run into those instances where we need to balance out shadows, uh, I'm just gonna go to, you know, like one of these test images here. And let's just evaluate, like right now, I just have my uh, technical mapping going on right now. And I'm trying to think of the best tool to audition this on. Why don't we do, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do my, 
uh, colloid and see if this is working. I'm kind of in, in beta on this new version, but I believe, oh, actually, no, this is going to, this is not going to behave properly. So I'm going to go to a legacy version. Hang tight one sec. Let's get some input mapping because this old version of colloid is set up for ACEs and I'm actually not in ACEs right now. Let's just rough out a pipeline real quick here. So we're going to go a recap of what we touched on in our ACEs explained series. We're going to go Alexa to ACEs CCT and then we're going to go ACEs CCT uh, out to Rec 709. So that's our technical mapping. And now I want to drop in an instance of the print tool and take a look at the split toning component that uh, we're talking about here. So in this case, if we look at this image, you know, if I flip off and on here, that's the net effect of my print tool here. And you can see, I happen to actually be starting with pretty neutral shadows. So maybe even a better way to do this would be to look at a ramp and just get a sense for what's happening with the split toning by looking at our waveform. Blacks and highlights should always be neutral. That is false on its face. And that kind of speaks to that division that I mentioned a moment ago of color correction versus color timing or color grading or the more cinematic tradition. If we go back like through the, the photochemical process and we look at the way cinematic images have been mastered for the vast majority of their history, they're all going to film print stocks and all, 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 all film print stocks are going to exhibit this split toning behavior. So if we think about our aesthetic reference of cinema and of the color timing tradition, there's actually really no such thing as neutral shadows and neutral highlights. There's always going to be that push of cool into the bottom and that push of warm into the top. It's just a question of what cocktail of red, green, and blue and how aggressive that push on both sides is. But that notion that we should, uh, as a sort of matter of course, have neutral uh, blacks and highlights in our final image is true perhaps uh, when we're in a color correction model, when we're like getting a basketball game ready to go to air or we're cutting the nightly news. Yeah, that's uh, we're, we're, we're less concerned with aesthetics than we are with accuracy in those scenarios. And that's a valid uh, thesis. In the case of cinematic imagery, that's something that I'm happy to, to uh, encourage you guys to let go of and release. We really don't necessarily want or need neutral shadows and highlights. And that is yet another topic that we can go into of like, why is split toning aesthetically pleasing and what does it do for us? But suffice it to say for the moment, it does a lot for us. It has a number of important things that it does to our image that really shapes the image, gives it depth and gives it a, an, an overall sort of harmonized color palette as a baseline. So. Big long answer, uh, or, or uh, actually more like two answers to the question. But the, in, in summary, yeah, we want to be balanced feeding in. We don't want to be skewed or poisoned as we feed in. But when we're employing a uh, cinematic palette and something like a, a print stock emulation, we can safely release that idea that our shadows and highlights should be neutral in the final delivery. And let's see here. I'm going to unmute here, Gadali, so that you can actually hear uh, me on the Zoom. Hopefully that's helpful. And uh, cool. Let's hit our next one. Okay. We've got Rafa here, and he says, can you explain the concept of halation, how it differentiates from glow, and what's your approach to get it on Resolve? Oh, yeah. Great question. And hello to Rafa. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to have you here this morning. So yeah, let's talk about halation and let's talk about halation in uh, the, the strict sense of like it, its origin in photochemical workflows, which is really where uh, that specific term uh, originates from. So halation basically uh, comes down to the idea that we have light that is strong enough in the highlights when it's initially uh, being absorbed by a film negative that it's actually bouncing off of the very back layer. We have, you know, like three layers, uh, three emulsion layers uh, in a piece of negative film. And halation is what happens when light actually manages to punch through those three layers and it bounces off the backing and spills back into uh, those layers again and kind of creates a secondary glow. So that's the uh, sort of process that's going on there. And 
really what it like comes out to visually is we end up with kind of a red reddish gold glow in the highlights or in the top end and there's a bunch of different ways to go about uh, creating halation or emulating halation. Let's do a, a quick sort of example of, of how I've been doing it lately. And it's like kind of a moving target for me that changes a lot. Let's look at, let's find a shot with some nice strong highlights where it's gonna be as easy as possible for you guys to see over the feed here. Let's go to like this image. And I'm just gonna set up a, a kind of full strength like emulation uh, pipeline here. So let's do a good 2383 like so. And there's my, let's actually reset this output. And we're going to do something like that there. So we've kind of got our baseline now. And let me just do a quick primary. We'll, soften out our contrast just a little bit, drop our exposure hair, something like that. And now let's talk about some halation. So halation, uh, first of all, I would put in terms of order of operations, I would put it underneath my print layer and I would put it underneath any grain if I'm doing grain. And we often are doing grain when we do halation. And let's now go to my toolbox and I'll show you the way that I've been doing this lately. So before we dive into what's happening there, we can see, you know, this is quite subtle and actually I almost wish I had something with like a more localized, like pingy highlight to demo this on. I mean, we could do this on this uh, film image quite easily. So I've pasted this and uh, let's see here. And uh, so this is a Cineon scan. So I'm going to need to treat this slightly differently. I'm going to set that aside for a moment. I'm, I'm doing what I tell you guys never to do, which is uh, improper color management. But we can see the halation quite prominently there in that candle flame. So that is like textbook example of what halation looks like on a film. It affects our highlights and it gives us this kind of warm goldy glow. So let's now talk about how I am achieving that uh, here in Cyberzolve. So we talked, I think two episodes of grade school back, we talked about the significance of using uh, linear light uh, when we're grading and, and how it's a, an often uh, sort of underappreciated, misunderstood aspect of a grading workflow where there's a lot of operations that we need or we should do in a linear tone curve as opposed to like the gamma tone curve that we have when we're working display referred that I've been trying to kind of talk everybody uh, away from or even the log curve that I'm working in right now, the log C curve. We actually want to do halation like a lot of operations in a linear tone curve. So let me walk you through this node tree. So we're going to go from area Alexa log C to area Alexa linear. So there's no color space change. It's just the tone curve. There's no, excuse me, there's no color gamut change. There's just the uh, tone curve. And then uh, the book ended piece of it, I think this label is gonna be incorrect. It says CCT, but it's actually just going back to log C from linear. So if before I get into these, let's just kind of clarify, if I disable those and then I enable and disable these bookending nodes, there's no net result on the image. It's a, it's, it is a net zero round trip. However, we're gonna see in a moment that doing these operations that I do for my halation in a linear tone curve is going to net better results. So that's the, the sort of foundation there is we're round tripping into linear, back out. And that's a really common process. Like I say, that's something we can do for color temperature, for exposure, a lot of different uh, adjustments actually benefit from a linear tone curve. And the net effect of that linear tone curve round trip is and should be zero. There's no effect of actually going to linear and back out. It's that the actual process that we wish to apply works better inside of that linear tone curve. So now that we are in our linear, linear tone curve and we understand kind of the round trip that we're working with, let's talk through what's going on here. So you'll see uh, a lot of people talk about creating halation uh, with a qualifier, which is fine. But as you guys know, I, I've got no great love lost for qualifiers. I think they're in general like one of the narrowest tools that we can use and resolve, and I'm generally looking for the broadest possible tool that I want. So I will use them, but usually as kind of a last resort. And in this case, what I'm doing is using blending modes and curves to get a very gentle version of the operation. So what I'm doing here is I've got a layer mixer node going on, 
I've got a composite mode of add, meaning that the value of the pixels in my top layer here are being added to the value of the pixels in my bottom layer, as opposed to a normal blending mode where I would simply be superseding the value of my lower layer with the value of my upper layer like so. So it's a slightly different behavior that again is modeling that sort of uh, spillback that we get uh, on a film negative where, hey, it's all the negative, all the uh, light that's being encoded into the uh, analog material, plus the light that's actually bouncing back off of the, uh, the backing of the film and spilling back onto the emulsions for a second time. So that's why the, the add model is appropriate here. And what I'm doing is, you know, in just kind of a custom hand tuned way, using my custom curves to pump some red blur up into the top of my image, as you guys can see here. And it's just a little bit, you know, it doesn't take a ton to get me the effect I want. And if I go over here to my blur, you can see the final uh, piece, which is just kind of a custom felt out cocktail of uh, red blur and green blur. I don't need any blue blur because that's not generally something that I'm gonna see uh, in, or, or ever something that you're gonna see in halation on actual film negative. And that's the aim here is to, you know, create a, uh, you know, sort of analytical uh, model of a, the halation behavior of a piece of film neg. So that's kind of the ingredients that are going into the halation there. And then all I do from there is I, you know, like I, I, once upon a time I created this and then I made it into a compound node, which for those of us who aren't familiar simply means we can cook down an entire stack of nodes into a single node and then dive back into it as needed without like crowding up our node tree in the meanwhile. And the final ingredient that I'll use here is a, a trick that I'm not sure I've actually talked about before on the channel. You guys might be hip to it already, but if we go here to uh, this uh, key uh, section or palette of the node graph, or of uh, my tools down here at the bottom rather, I can modulate how intense this halation is with this key output gain. So if I want zero output, I wanna go back to where I started, I can do that. And now this halation compound node is having no effect whatsoever because its output is at zero, meaning 0%. Zero Likewise, I could go to 0.25 if I just wanted a little splash of it, or I could modulate it anywhere in between. So I kind of like with a film print, I, I I often will back off from like full strength. You know, I, I would say a hundred is roughly like my my best visual take on like, this is what full strength negative halation looks like. I usually don't go that high. I usually want just a splash of it, just enough so that it's just barely perceptible, but it's quite felt, if that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of my approach to halation. I think the most important thing is understanding the concept. If you're wanting to model the, the you know, the actual uh, film negative uh, type of halation we're usually talking about when we use that word, the most important thing is to understand roughly the concept of what's happening to a film negative when that uh, characteristic uh, presents itself, and then to come up with a model of it that you feel good about. And again, like I said, for me, that model includes working in uh, a linear tone curve and also using my custom curves for a more gentle introduction of that blurred highlight, as opposed to a qualifier, which is gonna be inherently narrower. Although of course I could soften things out, uh, you know, to like some crazy extent, but at a certain point, it just feels more organic and uh, like a better fit to use those custom curves. Well, and it looks like we can only see your face right now. Can you? Oh goodness! I left it. I left it on my face. Let's let's go back. How, how Gadali? How 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 much of this did I uh, dumbly do uh, just on my face without showing the screen? Most of it. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's take a victory lap through it. So you guys now have a, a very good aural foundation and now we're going to pair it with some visual. Okay. So halation compound node, everything's been cooked down uh, into a compound. We're going to dive into this compound node and we talked about our linear bookends. So I'm going from log, log C in this case, to linear, and then from linear back to log C as my bookends. And as we can see in the image here, if I turn off what's happening in between those bookends, there's no net result from that round trip from uh, log to linear and back again. It's just that I wanna do my operation in uh, that linear space for this halation node. And then here within that linear tone curve, we have a layer mixer and we're using a blend mode of add so that instead of superseding the pixels of my top, or excuse me, the, the top, uh, layer of my layer mixer superseding the pixels of my lower layer, I am actually uh, doing an add, like so, composite mode add, meaning that the value of my pixels in the top layer are being added to the value of my pixels from the bottom layer. Bottom layer is just a dummy version of the image. There's no actual grade happening here. It's just kind of my foundation. This is, uh, if we go back to that 
concept that I laid out a moment ago about the way negative uh, uh, pollation is created, it starts with that base layer and uh, just the base exposure. So this is that aspect. And then we are adding back in this top end glow using our custom curves, using this shape that you guys can see down here to just add in a little bit. You can see like I could easily go absolutely bonkers with this more than I would want to. And I'm going to get banding and I'm just generally going to get, you know, like now I am doing more of a global like like glow and gain on my image, which isn't my intention. I just want to get that splash of diffusion up in the very top end. So I'm going to reset that back to where it was. Uh, and then on the blur side, just to give you the actual visual on it, uh, I'm doing a custom combination of red and green blurring. I'll sometimes mix that up uh, if I feel like it's not doing what I want with a given grade or if I'm working with a client, they're like, oh, it actually looks a little too red. Can we go more goldy or more yellowy? Like that's a, a, a subjective uh, variable that I'll play with. But where I've got it saved in my toolbox here is a setting that generally works for me as a good baseline. And then just to cap it off, if I go back outside of this compound node that I uh, cooked everything down into, I can go to my key output gain and I can modulate uh, this variable here to get myself all the way down to zero if I want and then go all the way back up to one or anywhere in between. So it kind of becomes like a creative knob for like, oh, how much of that vibe do you want uh, on your particular image? So that's kind of the way that I uh, typically tackle halation. Like I said, it should go upstream of your print curve and upstream of any grain if you happen to be doing that, which I'm not in this case. All right. Okay. Uh, Jim asks uh, if you can explain linear further. I think it would help the rest of the explanation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a bigger conversation to be had here about tone curves in general. And uh, if you want to get a bit more of a foundation on this, I think uh, among other videos, the Aces Explained series goes into color spaces and tone curves a bit more. But like a quick overall summary is when we talk about a color space, we're really talking about two things. We're talking about the purest or like most saturated red, green and blue that we can reproduce. And we're also talking about the tone curve of the image. So if we step away from cameras and eyes and displays for just a moment and we think about light out there in the physical world as it would be seen by an objective measurement device uh, or, or just as it exists out there, that tone curve that that light operates on, the way it scales is what's known as a linear tone curve. And let's, let's just like demo this out. Let me actually just drop this halation thing back on here. Um, so the linear tone curve, it's it's all about the way that we are mapping and reproducing the journey from pure black to pure white, if that makes sense. And if we look at an image in a linear state, this is the linearized version of this image, which we were just looking at. And it looks wrong to our eyes because our eyes actually don't perceive images or perceive light at all on a linear tone curve. We actually have a logarithmic response in our eyes. So that's why the linear tone curve is good for like that. That's the way it works out there in objective reality, but that's not the way that it works for our eyes. It's also not the way that it works for most cameras uh, because it's actually more efficient to capture things on a logarithmic tone curve. You can capture more dynamic range that way. So suffice it to say, like there are just like with color gamuts, you know, like there's dozens and hundreds of, of different color gamuts that have been specified. There's lots and lots and lots of tone curves out there. There's Airy Log C, uh, Log 3 G10, S Log 3, S Log 2, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of different log curves uh, or uh, excuse me, tone curves. And then we've got gamma curves like Rec 709. We've got only one linear curve because it's just neutral. But there's lots and lots of variations on this, but it's helpful to think in these in three sort of primary buckets. Uh, we've got our linear, which is like the default objective out there in the real world, physical light reality of things. We've got gamma, which is typically the tone curve that we use to encode for a display. So in the same way that this linearization of my image looks wrong, if I go to my output node here and I turn off my tone mapping that's taking me to gamma, let's go on a bit more of a visible image like this one and I turn off my final output uh, gamma mapping, 
this is where it looks correct with this gamma curve, uh, with it, my image encoded into a gamma curve. With it left in its log state, it also doesn't look correct. So that's you know the the the, the gamma curve side of things, uh, and then the log curve, like I mentioned. So we've got our log curve, our linear curve, and our gamma curve. And if we can get a sense for what role each of those play in imaging and in our pipelines, then we can start to understand when it's best to use which and when we want to transform from one to another. It's a big topic, but hopefully that gives you a, a, enough to have a little bit more context for what we just talked about. Hey, Ali wants to know, can you explain the RGB mixer in depth? Also, why are there two other color channels in each channel? And Eric follows up with uh, wanting to know the same thing. He's saying it can be—I know it can be very powerful, but I don't fully get how to use it effectively. Why? Oh, why? Oh, I see. I see the question. Yeah, let's check out the mixer. It—it it is indeed very powerful. Um, and I'm trying to think if this is going to help or confuse the issue. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and, and you guys can can tell me if I'm making it easier or harder to understand. I want to sort of tie this into what I was just talking about with color gamut, okay? So if we once again zoom out to away from displays and eyeballs and everything else, we have, uh, or at least zoom out from image reproduction for a moment, there's this big broad band of uh, radiation out there in the world, the electromagnetic spectrum. There's a really narrow band of that that we actually perceive as color and light as human beings. There's a, a narrow range of it to which our eyes are sensitive to and which we perceive as light and color. So when we get into imaging of any sort, where we're capturing and reproducing images, we need some way of measuring, okay, well, what percentage of the purest red, green, and blue that I'm capable of seeing, what percentage of that pure red, pure green, and pure, pure blue is this device capable of capturing or reproducing? So that's what a color gamut is effectively. It's like, what is the purest red, purest green, purest blue that the device can capture or reproduce? Now, hang with me. I'm gonna come back to the RGB mixer. So the way that we move in between different color gamuts, starting with what's called like the CIE 1931 color gamut, which literally describes the full range of uh, electromagnetic wavelengths to which our eyes are sensitive, the way that we move between from one color space to another is we tell it, we, we transform the red, green, and blue primaries. So we literally mix our uh, primaries together. So like, let's just look at uh, a matrix transform. Uh, let me just find one of these here. Anytime you use a color space transform, you are doing something like this. Let's look at, let me see if I have a really clean, simple one. So here's a good one. This is going from uh, XYZ to airy wide gamut. This is a, a color gamut transformation. And you can forget about all the intimidating looking code for a moment and sort of parse this into a couple basic pieces. We are saying, okay, our red equals our input red multiplied by this amount, plus our input green multiplied by that amount, plus our input blue multiplied by that amount. And we do the same thing with green and the same thing with blue. And the reason I show this to you guys and the reason uh, that this all came to mind when we started talking about the RGB mixer is because we could recreate, if I were to punch these numbers into my RGB mixer, I would be getting the same thing. If I did whatever that first number is of a 1.6, and then I did like a negative 0.49, like I could go and sort of hand recreate the RGB mixer. So it's literally a way of mixing together the amount of red, green, and blue that is feeding into the mixer and changing its output. And maybe another interesting way to think about this would be if we go to, if we do a splitter combiner node, like so, I'm doing that with option Y, or we could go to uh, color, nodes, add splitter combiner. Now I have my red, green, and my blue channel separated out and if you look, these are actually all just monochrome. So there's no color in there until we combine them together. So it's helpful to remember that our red, green, and our blue channels are just monochrome that only take on color when we mix them. So that's kind of the fundamental role of the RGB mixer is we are saying, hey, the grayscale channel that comprises my red input, I want you to re uh, concoct that channel with, say, 80% of the 
red. And then I want you to take some of the what's, co what's coming in from this version of the image and maybe some of what's coming in from that version of the image and reconstitute things uh, into a different form. Now, that's a bunch of, you know, like information and data about, uh, you know, color transformation and color matrices and the way that we can use the RGB mixer. The, the, to go back to the, the question about like why it's so powerful, one of the reasons it's so powerful is because it's very clean. We're literally taking, we're just taking our existing channel information and remapping it and reconfiguring it. So it's uh, theoretically a very clean way of manipulating our image. I can tell you guys in practice, it's not a tool that I use creatively or correctively, uh, terribly consistently inside of Resolve. Generally, when I'm looking to perform this kind of operation, I will use a transformation matrix like this one that we were just looking at. Or uh, I will, uh, yeah, I mean, really the, the transformation matrix is the more common form of it. Just so happens not that long ago, we didn't actually have these DCTLs like the one I'm showing you here. And the only way that we had of making a gamut transformation or one of the better ways anyway, was to manually dial in the values of uh, each of these channels kind of by hand. So that's the idea with the RGB mixer. Uh, and if I blew your mind and you didn't follow everything, that's okay. I, I would say the RGB mixer is sort of one of the last corners of Resolve that you need to gain mastery over in order to be able to use it really effectively in a wide variety of uh, different grades and projects. All right, Alexander asks, when talking about film as a reference point for cinematic images and incorporating its characteristic grades, what qualities should you emulate when grading monochrome images? That's a great question. Yeah, so when you're grading monochrome images, you know, like, let, let's, to, to answer that question best, let's zoom out for a moment and think about, uh, again, kind of the biology of the human eye. So our eye is comprised of rods and cones. Uh, rods are responsible for perceiving contrast, changes in luminance. Cones are responsible for perceiving color or uh, color information like how red, how green, how cool, how warm, what have you. Anybody want to take a guess, or maybe some of you guys already know, what the balance of power between uh, those two different types of photoreceptors in our eyes are? We have way more rods, way more rods than cones. Uh, there, there's, I'm sure, all kinds of evolutionary uh, explanation for why that's the case, but we have far more rods than cones, meaning that we are far more sensitive to contrast and luminance than we are to color. And that's one of the reasons that the whole black and white experiment even works. Uh, I, I remember like finding it fascinating in the early days of, of like uh, of, of being in film school and starting to get more serious about uh, motion pictures is like, why does that even work? Like, why do our eyes accept a two dimensional grayscale image? Like, how is it that we're able to enter into it and be absorbed by it? But we are. And one of the reasons is that because we have that sort of priority in our visual system, we care more about that than uh, than we do about the color of things. So what I would say uh, to answer things succinctly is you can, if, if we take away any sort of colorimetric aspects of film emulation because we're reproducing or mastering a black and white image, what we're left with is contrast, which is the characteristic aspect, in my opinion, of uh, a film emulation is the big rolling S-curve that you guys have probably heard me talk about before. That like, again, if we just look at you know, like let's put a ramp up behind this image and I'm going to turn off my output transform in a moment so that we can see what is starting as just a pure boring linear ramp like so. And like the contrast curve is is what's happening now. This is a filmic contrast curve. It's got a big deep uh, toe and a big rolling shoulder. So it's compressing a lot of dynamic range, but also creating a lot of contrast in the image. And that's something that we don't need color to do effectively. So that would be my first answer to that question is I would really, really fuss even more than uh, usual over your contrast curve and creating a filmic contrast curve that is nonlinear and rolling as opposed to linear. Like if we just compare, let's turn this off and do like some vanilla linear contrast like so. Oh, actually, 
You guys might know about this option already, but I'm gonna go to my project settings, general options, and I'm gonna tell Resolve I don't wanna use S-curve for contrast. I usually leave this turned off because I, I wanna create rolling contrast in other ways, and at the, at the individual shot level, I want linear contrast. That's a conversation, uh, a separate conversation. But if we just compare like, you know, visually the linear the the linear contrast that i'm doing here with creating it with filmic with like a, a rolling contrast curve it has a very different quality to it so that would be the number one thing that i would focus on if i were doing a, a black and white uh uh you know like print emulation is i would really really uh, obsess over what my contrast curve is going to be because i don't have the color variable to uh, focus on or play with so much. It's just about that contrast curve. And then all kinds of other things come become fun as well when you're thinking about black and white, because without going too crazy into this world, because it's such an interesting one, we can actually play around a lot with some of the RGB mixer ideas that we just talked about. And maybe this is a an application that I wasn't thinking about and I should have mentioned a moment ago. If we say like, all right, I'm going to run this through, let's say, a, a, a non-split toned 2383. And I don't know uh, if we were talking about images that were acquired in black and white or if we're doing a black and white grade after the fact. But if they were acquired in color, it can be kind of interesting. Like, of course, on the baseline, we can be like, all right, we'll just pull all of our saturation out of the image. But this is where things can get really fun if we turn that off. And if I go back to the RGB mixer, there's this other mode of things where if I hit this monochrome button here, I can turn that off and then I can play with the weight of each of these channels. It's an easier concept to feel and play with and to understand, but you're going to see that different of the incoming hues are being mapped brighter or darker depending on where I park these sliders. So this monochrome mode, I'm actually really glad we brought up the uh, black and white emulation thing because it l let me allowed me to round out something I forgot to mention about the mixer a moment ago, uh, where we can change the relative weight of incoming hues, even if they are ultimately being cooked down into a black and white image, which can be really interesting. And you can think a lot about this in terms of emulating historical processes with uh, black and white films. You know, like there are, you, you can read up on all kinds of interesting techniques that were used in the black and white days of like, you know, adding various like like filtration over the lens, like color filtration over the lens to get the kind of thing that we're seeing here where you're changing the weight of the image uh, based on uh, the incoming hue value, uh, where you could like turn skies super dark or skin super bright. There's a whole world that you can read about, uh, a, a lot of it in the back issues of American Cinematographer about using color filtration on black and white negative to change the weight of uh, the hues that are being captured. So some food for thought about uh, black and white uh, emulation and reproduction. Allen wants to know, can you explain the gamut mapping and the behavior of tools in an ACES workflow? Yes. So two distinct questions. Let's talk first about the gamut mapping side of things. So if we piggyback off of the uh, conversation we were having a moment ago where like, I'm going to do right now uh, a color space transform just to demonstrate like if I want to just change my color gamut without worrying about the tone curve side of things for a moment. And let's say I'm in Area Alexa and this is going to look wrong, but that's not the point necessarily. I'm in Area Alexa and I want to get to Rec 709. Okay, like so. And this is this is uh, a straightforward color space transformation and actually what's going on under the hood right now in this color space transform is a matrix like we looked at uh, with our RGB mixer or like we saw demoed here in this code. This is the exact form and math. I mean, not the exact numerals, but this is the exact formula and type of math going on under the hood that is causing the color space transform to remap me from my area Alexa wide color gamut into Rec 709. So that is straight up uh, just gamut transformation, if you will. You, you could call that gamut mapping. But usually when we're talking about gamut mapping, what we are talking about is uh, a situation like we're actually in right now where I have Area Alexa as my input space and I have Rec 709 as my output space. And some of you guys might know 
Rec 709 is a significantly smaller color space than Arri Alexa wide color gamut, meaning that the purest red, green, and blue that Rec 709 can reproduce is significantly smaller than the purest red, green, and blue that Arri Alexa can reproduce. So that means we run into issues because the moment that we have an incoming hue, which is more saturated, more pure than uh, Rec 709 can reproduce, we got to figure out what to do with that. And by default, it's just going to clip out and hit on the very outer edge of what Rec 709 can do. And that's usually not the most desirable uh, way for us to get those adjustments. So let's just see. I want to see if I can find kind of a practical example of this for you guys. Maybe if I go to a synthetic chart, hopefully we can get some clipping so we can see the way this plays out. So you can see in my like Rec 709 output transform that I have here, I have my saturation compression turned on, which is basically a way of getting me a more perceptually pleasing, more perceptually smooth reproduction of a big color gamut within the confines of a smaller color gamut. And I'm crossing my fingers that when I turn this off, we're going to see some clipping. Huh, no such joy. I guess there's not enough color information in here for it to matter. I mean, the other common example that uh, you guys might be hip to, let's go like, I know this shot is a, one that I often use as an example. Let's circle back on ACES now, since that was the other part of our question. And let's set up a quick pipeline here, going from Alexa and, oh wait, we want to go Alexa into ACES CCT. And then we want to go from ACES CCT out to Rec 709. Now, you guys are going to see up here in the upper left, this little nasty aberration going on there. You see that? That wasn't in the original image. That's happening as a result of my color management. That's a perfect example of uh, what I would call gamut clipping. And that is actually arising from the fact that airy wide color gamut has a slightly purer uh, green and blue primary than the ACES CCT color gamut does. So by default within an ACES pipeline, which as of ACES 1.1, which we have here in Resolve, ACES 1.1 actually doesn't use gamut mapping like I was just describing. It just linearly maps things from one color space into another, which means, you know, on one hand, that's a very clean operation and it's very reversible. The moment you start gamut mapping things, it's generally difficult to reverse that operation because it's so nonlinear and, and complicated. So it's good in that ACES is very like future proof and that's why there's no gamut mapping incorporated as of ACES 1.1. But you can see the downside is because there's no gamut mapping, it's not being at all wise about what to do with these values that are outside of uh, the gamut of ACCCT. It's just letting them clip and look nasty, which is generally not the uh, aesthetic preference. So gamut mapping, which in ACEs is not really available to us and definitely not under our control. Gamut mapping is uh, an oper is is trying to take the in, an incoming gamut that's far larger than the output and mapping it in an aesthetically pleasing way to fit within uh, the available uh, purity of red, green, and blue. Now, within ACES, like I say, we don't have gamut mapping. I believe as of ACES 1.3, or a matter of fact, I know as of ACES 1.3, there is a new system implemented for dealing with issues like that, where we're going from a big color gamut to a smaller one, and we actually need some gamut mapping to get a reliably smooth reproduction of our original image. Did I cover that, that both parts of that question? I think I did. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, behavior of tools. Let's, let's, let's touch on that for just a moment. So this is something that you can see demoed in greater depth in ACES Explained as well as the Create Better Contrast series. But the main thing to understand kind of at our foundational level is our tools, with the exception of the HDR palette here in Resolve, which is the one set of tools in Resolve that is what's called color space aware, meaning that the actual operations change based on the tool's knowledge of our color space. Let's set that aside for a moment. It's actually a more advanced toolkit that we don't need to dive into uh, right off the bat when we're uh, learning resolve and grading. Any other tool always, always, always behaves the same. Like lift, gamma, gain, offset, contrast, pivot. Any of these tools are always gonna do the exact same thing to our pixel data, exact same thing. Only thing that's gonna vary is the state of the image when we feed it to that tool and what we do to that image after that manipulation. And that's why things can feel 
in fact, do feel quite different if I'm working, you know, just as a very simple example, let's do an airy to seven or nine LUT on this image. And let's go, let's actually go to a, a slightly more uh, balanced kind of normal image. So if I go to do an airy to seven or nine LUT here, any of you guys who've played around with this stuff before know that this will feel very different than this even though I'm doing this, I'm using the same tool. And that often leads us to go like, oh, well, what's the difference between the tool when I'm in ACES or when I'm working upstream or downstream of a LUT? Tool is exactly the same. It's the state of the image that you are feeding to that tool and what's happening to that modified image after you use that tool. So to directly answer the question, the tools in ACES are going to behave pretty darn similar to the way that they're gonna behave in any color managed kind of scene referred log working space workflow. So the, it, the, the comparison of like, oh, what is like lift gamma gain offset, contrast pivot, all, all those tools, what do they feel like in ACES versus resolve color management? Negligible, in my opinion. They're gonna feel a little bit different because again, that downstream transformation is not identical, but it's close enough and you're working on a similar enough image state that you're not gonna feel a really big difference in the way those tools behave, especially if you compare that to uh, a more extreme example of like, all right, what's lift gamma gain contrast pivot gonna feel like if I'm in a log space versus in a gamma like scene or a display referred space, those are gonna feel quite different because those are very, very different states of image that we are operating on. One is having an additional operation to transform to display space happen downstream, and the other is generally having no operation because we're already in a gamma display state. Hope that helps. Jordan wants to know, you've mentioned that you only use circular power windows. Could you explain how you're able to make it so versatile? Yeah, great question. And hello to Jordan, glad to have you here. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute. Let me get an output transform going back on my image here. And I would say my answer to that question really uh, comes down to two ingredients. The first is, you know, like I, I, I demoed this in uh, the last installment of Create Better Contrasts, that of course I can do any shape that I want to using a circular, or I can, excuse me, do any like uh, aspect ratio that I want to with my window, up to and including making a straight up grad, a horizontal by going to 100, a vertical by going to zero, and then playing with my softening. So, you know, like that's really all that it comes down to that, you know, like the aspect ratio, scaling amount of softness, and then the uh, rotation of things. Those are the tools that I'm, I'm, I'm working with when to make a, a power window do what I want it to do. So there's not like some secret tool that I'm using uh, to get more com to get more complex behavior out of the tool. Um, and really the reason why that tends to suffice for me is because of a lot of the stuff that I talked about in that last uh, installment of the Create Better Contrast series where I'm trying to work as simply and cleanly and broadly and softly as possible. So for example, I'm not gonna claim to you that like, oh, if I wanted to do, I don't know, like a power window around her nose, you can see I suck at using this tool because I never use it. Uh, but I'm not going to claim to you like, oh, I could draw that with using the circular power window. Like, obviously not. That's a more nuanced, like, uh, tightly defined shape than I could get with the circular power window. I just generally don't ever ar arrive at that need to do that. Um, if you're doing the one sort of notable exception for me would be like for commercials where like sooner or later, if you're doing a commercial that is highlighting virtually any kind of product, at some point you're going to have to break all of Cullen's rules and do like, let's do a really tight window around, uh, you know, the pickle on the cheeseburger or, you know, like the, the uh, uh, front bumper of the car or whatever the case may be. Like in a commercial, you're almost always going to have to get graphical and 2D and like draw tight shapes and make really, really targeted adjustments to those things. And, you know, like as I've shared with you guys before, like if I'm in session and that's what I need to do to make a client happy, like I'm very, very happy to do it. It's just that that's kind of my last resort. And I, I usually find there are better solutions, except at that very extreme end of things of like, no, that's actually exactly what we want is we want the, the ice cube and the Coca-Cola to pop a little bit more like, all right, we're, we're going to have to get targeted if that's what we want to do. But short of those things, I think we all reach for complexity and intricacy too often and too soon. And that's why that, that, that's sort of the philosophical underpinning to my circular power window thing is like, 
I, I've gotten very disciplined over the years about like, how can we do it simply? How can we do it with a big, broad, soft shape? And again, if we think back to that thinking photographically concept that I talk about so much, like that's what, if, if I'm seeking as much as possible to emulate like what a gaffer would do on the day, that's the effect that like, you know, uh, a, um, a cutter or, you know, like, like any anything that they would do to shape things on the day other than adding a bunch more light it's going to take the form of a very soft broad adjustment to some portion of the image and it's generally not going to have the effect of what i would get out of like drawing some kind of complicated polygon uh, on on the image so it's it's a a fun exercise that sometimes you end up on the wrong side of but it's a fun exercise to be like all right how can i do what i'm trying to do with a the simplest possible shape and with as little or no tracking as possible once you're into that realm of like spatial contrast and geometry. Colleen Shabani is curious uh, to know, many pro colorists use a fixed node tree with multiple parallel nodes. Why is that? <sighs> Good question. I don't know, to be honest. I just don't know. Um, I I, th I think that it ha probably has to do, if I had to venture a guess, it has to do with creating a versatile node tree that allows for, um, you know, like kind of absorbing whatever is thrown at you. Um, and I would actually be fascinated to hear the answer to that question from any colorists who do choose to roll that way. Uh, I don't know if I have a tree handy. I probably have one somewhere in here. But the, really, the best I can answer that is to show you guys my tree, which I would not say is common, but it is very effective. Here, here, here would be an example. I'm just going to very quickly uh, build out what my tree would look like. I've got these beta tools that are a little funky, but they will give us the idea. I would do exposure, points, Kelvin and primary. And then I'll sometimes have a final sort of standby window that I've set into an outside mode for like a, a vignette or a little bit of shaping uh, that all it, it's obviously this uh, node is not doing anything at all right now, but it's there at the ready for me. This is like my preferred fixed node tree. Set my exposure, use this points uh, uh, tool from my colloid kit to uh, balance out any uh, of those balancing issues that we talked about at the start of today's session of like, oh, it's a little bit green. Like, let's pull a quarter point of green or whatever we want to do there. And then Kelvin, I'm now doing uh, no longer with my colloid tool because in Resolve 17, we have color space aware temperature, which is going to be photometrically accurate. Primary is where I'm going to do any overall kind of contrast, like, you know, add, add some contrast pivot, pull some out, you know, any kind of shaping that I want to do there. And then my vignette. And those are the only tools that I'm comfortable adding into a fixed node tree because any I, I certainly do all kinds of stuff above and beyond this in the course of a given grade, but I don't want to put those in as a given or as something that I just plan to do. The only things I want to plan to do is this stuff right here. And then if I need to get more complex, more color correct, -y, uh, more uh, sort of like uh, focused uh, with my work, I'll add that stuff a la carte, but I'll, I'll fight pretty hard. And I, fight is not even the right word. I'll, I'll say this, I've gotten, for the work that I do, for the clients that I work with, I've gotten very, very proficient at giving them what they want and uh, accomplishing my visual goals using this toolkit right here. And uh, I, I rarely have to move beyond it, uh, except in very specific instances. So regarding the parallel mixer, uh, if you find out, uh, Ali, let me know, because I actually would be very curious to know. And I certainly don't claim that I, I have the only solution or that I have the best solution. But this is uh, kind of my node tree that has served me uh, very well over the years as I've continued to simplify it. And it allows me to move really fast and to get good results with the minimum amount of complexity. That's a great question. So I believe at some point in my library, there's a there, there's a, a video on this subject. I think it's under the simplified grading heading. But let's just kind of recap what I talked about there. And, and maybe I'll, I'll have to go back and watch it. I made that a while ago. So maybe my entire philosophy has changed. I'll give you the latest and greatest uh, philosophy for that stuff on me. So there or that I have rather. 
So I'm going to give you two sort of warring schools of thought for uh, how to think about that. The way that I was taught uh, to balance things out when I first started grading, like let's find a, I don't know, let's, let's go to this image is fine. I'm going to kind of zero out all of my extra bells and whistles for now. And we're just going to look at a properly mapped image like so. So one way that we could approach balancing that uh, is is talked about a lot and that I was shown when I first started grading. So if I go to my RGB parade here, I can just look at this image. And if I'm in a log state, I can use offset. And I can just look at my red, green and my blue channels. And I can say, oh, let me, I'm just going to kind of line up the peaks, you know. And in this case, it's not so far off to begin with. Like, let's look at th this image is probably even better because it's like all thrown out of, out, of, out of whack, like in the way it's coming in. It's not, those peaks are not balancing in their initial state. So I could kind of take this approach of just trying to line up my peaks a little bit. And like, you can see visually, like that does work. Like this feels more neutral to me, you know? Um, so that would be kind of like the canned most common answer is like, hey, break out that RGB parade and try to get your peaks as well as uh, the bottom of things sort of lined up a little bit more. So if I were to really take this school of thought uh, out to its conclusion, I would then look at, you know, like it, it seems like the floor on my red and my green channel is a little elevated compared to the floor on my blue channel. So I might now go to my like lift on my red channel and try to drop that down. And then I might need to go to my gain or my offset and kind of balance it back out. You guys will notice there's a lot of interaction between these tools, but like that would be me, you know, like playing this concept out as far as I can take it. And then maybe the green lift needs to come down a little bit more. And maybe the green gain needs to come back up a little bit more. So I could kind of keep going here and I could make a very obsessive exercise out of like, I want to see the very bottom, of each of these, the very top of each of these, and sort of the overall center mass of each of these channels really line up perfectly. And that will generally get you a more quote unquote neutral image. Um, my beef with it is that this approach doesn't take context into play at all. So like this is an image that clearly wasn't shot to be neutral. Like all of the blue push and wash that I'm seeing in this image, that cinematographer didn't make a mistake. This is what the creative intent of the frame was. So the question for me becomes like, all right, the moment that I do receive material that has creative intent that doesn't include like a pure bullseye zero white, how do I balance in that situation? How do I be sensitive to what I'm being handed and actually balance in uh, the right way in those scenarios? I'll give you my sort of like upgraded concept or approach to balancing. If we think about balancing, of course, we're talking about color, right? And you guys have heard me talk in the past about sort of color prioritization. Some colors are more important than others, right? Like I don't really know, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, like, okay, back on this shot, I don't know what the color of the back of this chair that she was sitting on was here and neither does my audience. And I have a huge amount of latitude in terms of what color I, what hue I park that chair at and no one's gonna look at it and be consciously or subconsciously bumped because they have very little expectation, right? So that's kind of one extreme end of things. If we look at the other extreme end of things, what's one color that our audience is always gonna recognize, always have expectation of, and always be either consciously or subconsciously evaluating? The most extreme example of this, that would be skin, right? Skin is uh, the, the hue to which we are all the most sensitive to and to which we have the most expectation of and sort of the strongest internal uh, memory bank for that we are, whether we know it or not, trying to match things up to when we see them out in the real world. And when we see an image that doesn't match our expected skin tone reproduction, I mean, let's just do a quick example here. Let's add a little bit of contrast to make this easier to see. And let's just do a quick example with messing with skin tone before I go back to the balancing point that I want to uh, conclude with. So if I do a hue versus hue and sample her skin here, let me get my vector scope up and I rotate her skin just a little bit. She doesn't look well, does she? She looks sick and that's a little tiny adjustment. And I'm going to bet you guys, that's not just 
our eyes as filmmakers, like if I show this frame or this scene to my mom, and this is where the skin tone is, is parked, or to, to anyone who just is a, a, like a, a passive like consumer of images as opposed to a manipulator of images, they're all gonna have this reaction too. So this is not a question of elitism or like, oh, that's the details that we appreciate or understand as filmmakers. This is stuff that everybody notices. So the moment that skin is even a little bit off of our expectations, we notice. Same thing if I go this way. Now it's too red and it doesn't look right. It doesn't feel good. So the way that I think about balancing is I am very, very prejudiced toward nailing skin tone. And I really don't care. Everything else is a distant second for me. There are other priorities. Like I wanna get skies feeling good and foliage feeling good and products or pieces of wardrobe that were designed to look a certain way. Those things should be reproduced as expected, but skin is far and away the most important unless we're making nature documentaries, right? So if we think about things along those lines, I'm gonna pull in a shot that uh, is, I, I, I kind of pick on a lot. Uh, let's see if I have it at the ready here. It's a, it's a shot, uh, I believe it's an R3D here that I'll show you guys. It's, a, it's one that comes in kind of off kilter that uh, benefits from this approach to balancing as opposed to you know sort of that initial one that we talked about so i'm just going to drop this in and let's transform this we're going to debayer this in the proper way i'm just doing some good old color management and you guys are, are getting to see like how I would handle this. So I'm, I happen to be working in Arri log C in, uh, for my timeline working space. So I'm gonna debayer this into red wide gamut log 3G10, and then we're gonna do a transformation from red to log C. So now I have an appropriately, an accurately color managed image. And if we look at, I'll, I'll show you like the way that I, I would balance a shot like this. Maybe I've, I've noticed that, you know, by the time I add a little bit of contrast, it doesn't look so great. It looks kind of weird, right? And the way I would evaluate, all right, I've, I've, maybe I've spotted what looks weird, but I'm not sure where to go. I would go to my output transform downstream of my final uh, display prep, and I would do a window that I'm not actually gonna make any adjustments with. I'm just going to focus it on a good patch of skin, usually a forehead or a cheek. And I'm gonna go to highlight mode by hitting Shift H or hitting this magic wand up here. And I'm gonna look at where on my vector scope it's hitting. So you guys might be hip to this skin tone line here. It's not something that you want to be didactic about. And if you like the way an image looks, there's no reason that you need to make sure your skin tone is here. But in a scenario like this, where you're like, I do not like my skin tone. I want to change something. This will be my first sort of diagnostic is like, okay, well, in comparison to the skin tone line, where is it sitting? And if I get a bit of a tighter alignment to the skin tone line, do I get a preferable result? So it's not something you have to use, but you can use, it's your ally. Uh, so in this case, everything's coming in, uh, you know, in this kind of like reddish pink vector. So I could try a couple things, but the first that I would probably start with and in, in keeping with my, you know, like simplest possible solution would be to break out my points tool here. I don't know why there's that little dead primary adjustment there. And I would look at adding some green into the mix like so, and maybe that's too much, but just getting that kind of like half point of green so that I'm bisecting that skin tone line a little bit more. And if I go back to the timeline level and re-audition it, you can see I'm getting warmer here. So this would be, you know, with a shot like this, kind of how I would approach balance. And I would not worry so much about the other contents of the frame at the moment. I would worry about getting my skin tone roughly where I expect it here. And then I might play around with other balancing attributes around this once I've got the skin you know, kind of living in a proper place. And then just as another sort of example, actually I'll hold off on that for now. Yeah, this would be how I would tackle that. And I might play around with a couple things cause I'm looking at this and, you know, going back to what we talked about at the start of today's session, I'm like, yeah, you know, my shadows feel a little bit poisoned now. Like they're not, not quite so neutral. So maybe I want to play around with gain instead of uh, my points, which is like overall, like the entire signal basically. So if I try adding some green gain into things, I wonder what I would get out of it there. 
maybe that's a better result. I think it is. And then I can also play with my overall color temperature. I'm like, now that I've done that, maybe the other balancing thing would be, you know, kind of warming things a little bit. But this is all, you know, sort of like some more detail stuff about how I would think about balance. And I would think about it primarily in terms of skin tone. So you guys can see there, like, it's actually a little sneaky when I flip it on and off, but it's definitely a preferable result after the fact. The skin tone is matching what I expect to see and what I want to see out of this image. So I would prioritize skin tone and I would think about two axes rather than three. I, I've talked about this in other videos as well, where like, if you imagine an X where one side of the X is this skin tone line running all the way through the vector scope and the other, and the other side of the X is this magenta green axis, those are the two axes that I just manipulated to get this result. So I started with my green magenta axis. I'm like, I want to pull things more this direction on that axis. And then I started, and then I added in a manipulation along this axis to get a little bit warmer. So that can be two, you know, one good concept and one good technique for you. Think about skin, prioritize skin, and then rather than thinking, rather than thinking about, oh, let's add a little bit of red or pull a little, a little bit of blue, think about where on my green magenta axis do I want to go, if anywhere, and where on my color temperature axis do I want to go, and how uh, can I get a good result using those kind of concepts and tools. Yeah. Okay. So this will be a great one to wrap us up on here. So I'm going to mute this and let's, let's see here. Let's look at this. I'm going to, I'm going to put you up in front of everybody, Jordan. I hope you don't mind. All right. So, uh, while we watch this, Gadali, read, read that back to me one more time, what the struggle is. Struggling like crazy with making overcast days not look bland and boring. Gotcha. Yeah, let's just watch through this. I'm just going to let this roll for a minute. So while this goes, let's just start talking about, you know, I, Anything that we grade is about like, okay, what are we being handed and what are the, the sort of like likely tools that we're going to have for working with uh, our image and, and uh, you know, like taking it to a good place. So because we have these overcast days, one of the things that is making things potentially feel a bit blander is we have flatter contrast, right? There's not quite as much contrast as we would get like at a golden hour or, you know, like in a, a, a sunlit beach environment or something like that. So that means that we have lower contrast coming in. Maybe we want to think about how we might add in some more contrast and, di and tonal uh, dynamic uh, in that way. So it could be like pumping some extra contrast in there. The other thing that we could think about is the color side of things. And you guys have heard me talk about this before that like there's kind of a a balance to be struck with our contrast and with our color. So this is a big, broad generalization. But generally speaking, if your image or your grade has a high contrast ratio, you're generally not going to be able to go or want to go as far with your saturation. You're going to want that to be a little mellower so that the image just doesn't look crazy, exploded, bizarre. Um, so that's, you know, kind of like one aspect that we might think about there is like, all right, so or, or to finish that thought rather, when we have lower contrast, we can get away with higher saturations. And in fact, we may want higher saturations. So since that's kind of the case here is even if you pump some uh, contrast in in post, you just have a lower contrast ratio. So there may be room for introducing some more color. And that's a whole fascinating subject that we can uh, talk about uh, in definitely almost, but we could look at on the simplest level, just pure saturation knob, right? Maybe you can withstand more color than you think. We could get more complex from there and we could look at things like our, uh, I'm going to pause this right now. I think I get the idea. And, and by the way, Jordan, nice work. Don't, don't be too harsh on yourself. I think that you're, you're, you're looking good already. Um, but let's look at, you know, like I'm trying to see if I have any 
kind of similar-ish, kind of more mellow contrast ratio stuff. Eh, maybe something to look at for uh, a future piece. You know, for now, I'm just going to kind of pick out a random image that we can demo this concept on. So we could look at overall saturation, of course. We could look at our color boost, which is going to prioritize saturating the lower saturations and not letting the higher saturations bloom and go crazy. You could also look at your loom versus sat if you wanted to saturate the lower, uh, darker portions of your image. You could look at your sat versus sat, which is going to do something similar to your color boost, where you kind of prioritize saturating the lower saturations rather than the higher ones. And then you could also look at your hue versus sat and pick out maybe one or two key colors that recur a lot in your frames that you're like, hey, sometimes it's just about a single color. If there's a particular shade of blue or red that's recurring consistently in your images, if you have a targeted adjustment for like, hey, anytime I see that hue, I know that it's really gonna pop because I've selected, you know, whatever, like let's say the, this, this is not gonna be super visible, but let's just say like the, the color of these doors here, because there is a fair amount of that earthy color in here. And I'm gonna go a little more extreme than I might normally, but let's just try that, plus a little bit of hue versus loom to saturate, and then add some density to that color and then turn this on and off. So like I said, maybe that's more extreme than I would actually go, but that can be really, sometimes that's all we need is to identify a signature hue or two and really pump it up with a secondary across the board so that our image is getting those intermittent little pops and splashes of color within an overall kind of controlled and, uh, uh, you know, yeah, a controlled palette would be the best way to put that. So those would be a couple things that I would think about. And the last thing that I uh, would suggest would be a sort of manual implementation potentially of some split toning. So if we looked at doing something like this, where I'm gonna ungang my custom curves here, and I'm just gonna quickly do this, and you guys can see me. I think I go into more depth on this uh, in my building looks uh, series. But if I just do a custom cocktail of green and blue into my shadows, I'm creating those fixed control points along the uh, axis here by hitting option. And I'm basically gonna push some cool into the, into the shadows and some uh, warm into the highlights, like so. This is, you know, split toning, and I, I'm now gonna back this way off because I, I generally go strong uh, initially and then back it off. I could do that with my sliders here, or if I wanna back off everything uniformly and, and it's, it's all working, it's consistent with itself, I just want less of it. I could go over here to this key output gain like we talked about with our halation earlier and drop it to like a 0.5 or something like that. This is another really fun way of adding colorfulness to our image without it feeling like, oh great, some you know, like colorist thought they had a great idea and they would just smash the saturation knob up to 11 or whatever. Um, this can be a really sophisticated, subtle way of adding depth and colorfulness and sort of some extra separation to your image, all of which might be desirable properties that uh, the images that you just showed us uh, could benefit from. So I hope that's uh, helpful stuff to look at, uh, play around with it, and, and uh, we can definitely take a look at a revision if you want to do it, uh, show it to us again uh, next week or whenever you have it ready. Um, okay, guys, that's going to wrap it up for today. As usual, uh, time has flown by. Hope uh, this has been useful for y'all and fun for y'all. I always enjoy chatting with you guys and, and getting to go a little deeper on these uh, subjects. Uh, hope to do this again next Friday. So we'll uh, see you back here uh, if so. And if not, uh, we'll see you in the next video and keep the, the good questions and the comments coming. Thank you to Gadali for uh, being our uh, very capable co-host today and helping things roll smoothly. And uh, we'll see you guys next time.